Welcome to This Week in Intelligent Investing, where we examine timely and timeless investing topics to help you become a better investor. Enjoy authentic, unscripted discussion featuring Phil Ordway, Elliot Turner, and other thought-leading investors. Brought to you by MOI Global. And now, here's your host, John Michalczewicz. A very warm welcome to all of you uh, to a new episode of This Week in Intelligent Investing. Great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Phil Ordway and Elliot Turner, as always. Really looking forward to the discussion. So let's start with Phil. Over to you. Thanks, John. So given that it's Berkshire week, I know um, this is a week that a lot of us look forward to. And John, you don't usually make the trip over for it, but I know Elliot and I would probably be there and a lot of you guys would probably be there. And it's it's always a fun week. And unfortunately, this is the second year in a row we're going to miss it in person. But since it's happening online on Saturday, um, and surprisingly, since we actually haven't talked very much about Berkshire in the past, I don't know, six months at least, it seems like I thought this would be a, a good time to bring it up. We didn't even talk too much about the letter uh, when it came out several weeks ago. So the, what what spurred the idea, too, was on uh, the Monday preceding the annual meeting. So I guess this would have been the 26th of April. Uh, Yahoo's live streaming the, the annual meeting again this year, hosted a, a preview kind of hour long discussion among some really interesting people. So Larry Cunningham, friend of the podcast and all around great guy, Larry Cunningham organized this with Yahoo and he got Carol Loomis and Robert Hagstrom and Tom Gaynor to, to join. I don't know if you guys heard this already. If not, it was actually really pretty interesting. It had some good little nuggets and I think there's a replay available. So some of the fun things that, um, that stuck out to me where they were, they were talking about Carol Loomis was asked about some of the dirty little secrets about writing the letter. And the thing that was most interesting to me maybe wasn't that Buffett apparently starts writing it again after he's immediately after he sends it out, he starts writing the new one and that he has a working draft to Carol by October, you know, given that it's not actually published until September or until the following uh, February, rather, it's pretty interesting that, that he's got a working draft of it well before the calendar year is even over. But what I thought was, most interesting was that Carol said that she and Buffett, you know, they've been doing this like 50 years now. She said that she and Buffett actually send copies back and forth via snail mail because if they got on the phone and talked about it in real time, they'd start fighting about it. So I thought that was pretty interesting. But you can tell there's just a massive amount of work that goes into it. And that's why it turns out so well and has turned into such an incredible resource. And two related nuggets were that uh, when Larry Cunningham approached Buffett, but it would have been 25 years ago, give or take, about publishing the now famous collection he's produced called The Essays of Warren Buffett, uh, that that Buffett said, uh, you know, the, the, the publisher at Wiley had said, you know, we think this is going to be like the wealth of nations. And Buffett said, well, that's great. I don't want it to be the wealth of Wiley. So he gave Larry permission to do it, but he said it had to be self-published. Um, the other things that that stood out to people, I think, were that this year's letter, I mean, particularly Robert Hagstrom pointed this out that, you know, Buffett condemned an investment in bonds and fixed income in about the strongest possible terms that you'll ever hear from him uh, for obvious reasons that, you know, the yields have just plummeted and the the total returns are in some cases negative or or at best kind of de minimis and unlikely to keep pace with just about anything else. And, And Hagstrom then speculated that potentially part of the appeal in the new investments in Verizon and and uh, Chevron were partly driven by the yield that they were likely to produce as a, as a partial alternative. I actually disagree with that. I don't think that was probably the, the idea there, but it's an interesting thought uh, nonetheless. Other stuff that came out that I thought was really interesting was that about three decades ago, give or take, I don't think she specified exactly when, but uh, Kara Loomis said that, that Buffett pointed out to her a line that, that's always stuck with her. And it was when he said, you only need one stock to work out in your life. And his, you know, his implication was, if you get one good decision, one big decision really right, that's all you really have to do. And, and you're kind of set and everything else is gravy. And obviously Berkshire has been that one stock for thousands and thousands of individual shareholders. And that was the other thing that, that stood out to Larry Cunningham was that you know Buffett kind of characterized his shareholders uh, you know, institutional, passive, indexers, et cetera. And that it, it, it was the long-term individual holders that clearly had his affinity that were his clear favorites. Um, and indeed, many of them 
have been multi-decade holders and obviously been very well rewarded for it. So I think that that was pretty interesting. The other interesting comment that, that Robert Hagstrom was that he thought that Buffett's biggest contribution um, was actually building the Berkshire culture. So there was obviously some conversation about what's going to happen with Berkshire after um, you know Buffett and Munger are no longer on the job. And, and he pointed out that he thinks building that culture and having everything focused in the direction of rational, rational capital allocation is Buffett's biggest contribution and, and the, the biggest achievement, right? The hardest thing to pull off. And I tend to agree. I mean, I think we all underestimate how difficult it is to both design a culture and perpetuate a culture and how nearly impossible it is to change a culture. And so I tend to agree. And so the, the thing that really caught my attention about the overall discussion, and I want to get your take on this, Elliot and John, um, is that they put up a poll amongst the people who are who are listening. And I don't know, I, unfortunately, they didn't say how many people joined, but I'm assuming there were hundreds, if not thousands of people voting in this poll. And they said, what is the most distinctive aspect of Berkshire Hathaway, which was, it was actually asked more in the context kind of, of what's the biggest reason for Berkshire's success. And the choices were the trust-based culture, the decentralized autonomous managers, the permanence and long time horizon, or the quality shareholders. And what I thought was really interesting is that I would have voted, I did vote in almost reverse order to what the actual results were. So the number one reason cited or voted in the poll with 46% of the vote was the permanence and long time horizon. And in my opinion, that would be last. I mean, I, I would vote that last. I mean, it's great. Don't get me wrong. It's a huge advantage. But, you know, there are lots of businesses that persist for decades and can own subsidiaries for decades. And there are lots of, uh, you know, there's, there's even private equity funds that will now roll things over so many times from fund one to fund two to fund seven that I, I just don't think permanence and long time horizon is, it's, don't get me wrong, it's absolutely an advantage. And it's a whole hell of a lot better than a, an impermanence and a short time horizon, but I just don't think it's the most distinctive reason for, for Berkshire's success or the most distinctive aspect. So I actually would have added a fifth category or a fifth choice. And I would have said overall management competence, management genius in this case, their, their prowess in executing the capital allocation and, and particularly in the M&A uh, process and the management's ability to adapt and continue to move the ball forward, you know, in, in, four or five or six different iterations of the tactic, tactics they've employed to execute the strategy. So I think the overall quality of management, I, I just don't think, you know, there will be, and there are some people that, that replicate many aspects of Berkshire. And they actually talked about why more people don't do that. That was an interesting conversation too. But, that, you know, you could, you could basically replicate every possible thing you want about Berkshire and you'd never get the same result, of course, because you never have the same person running it the same two people running, right? So I think, the, I think we continue to underestimate the capability and the outright managerial genius of, of Buffett and Munger in running this company. So that would have been my vote for number one. Uh, number two would have been the trust-based culture. And that actually did get the second most votes. That got 27% of the votes. I think that goes hand in hand, though, with the decentralized autonomous structure of management. So that I kind of would have voted those tied for two and three because they're really so related. I'm not sure how you could how you could separate the two. I mean, without a trust-based culture, you could never have a decentralized autonomous structure. It just wouldn't work very well. So um, and then not to diminish it, but I would put quality shareholders then next. And that did in, indeed finish fourth in the in the poll with only 11 percent um, And again, I, I mean, these things are all necessary but in and of themselves, they're insufficient. And if I was forced to rank them, I mean, the quality shareholders are huge and there's a reason why the annual meeting is so important. And there's a reason why, reason why the quality shareholder base is so, is so crucial to uh, you know, the long-term success. But that said, given that Buffett already controlled you know, more than a third of the company since inception, more or less, since he took control of it, uh, even if the rest of you know, the other two thirds of the company, let's say, were owned by non-quality shareholders, you know, that would have been a real pain. It would have been less optimal, but Buffett still would have been Buffett. Berkshire still would have been Berkshire. It just wouldn't have been quite as good. So I just, if I'm forced to rank it, I would have bumped that down the list. So 
uh, that that's kind of my list. So John Elliott, I'm I'm curious for what you guys think you would say in, in response to that poll, or maybe you guys were on the the meeting the other day. Maybe you voted. What what do you think? Yeah, I wasn't on the meeting, but it's awesome how much you preempted a lot of what I was thinking and what I would have said immediately. Um, you know, I you can't separate trust based culture from decentralized autonomous managers. Like you can't have one without the other. How could you say one is more important than the other? Um, you use the word adapt, like management genius and their prowess and their ability to adapt. And it's like, even before you told me the four options, I was thinking, wow, well, you know, what's been most impressive about Buffett is that he's got core principles, but he's evolved. And the core principles have remained by and large the same, but, you know, he's evolved based on his environment. And it made me think of this tweet yesterday uh, from Breadcrumbs Research, which asked, like, what's common between outsider type capital allocators and tech founders like Bezos, Zuck, and Hastings? And, you know, I think my answer seems kind of similar, I, is how I would vote in this uh, Berkshire poll. You know, it was they all invest with the framework while recognizing the dynamism of the environment and allowing the framework to adjust accordingly. It's not shooting from the hip, even when it might look like it. And, you know, in the very beginning, who would have imagined Buffett buying a railroad, right? Like, how could you have even had that on your radar? And even in the immediate days preceding the uh, BNSF purchase, like who would have imagined anything about it from the B-share split to, you know, literally taking control of a railroad and then investing massive amounts of capital in it. So, you know, the ability to evolve, I think, is something that really stands out to me. Uh, and, and I'm also thinking, obviously, you know, the cigar bud to, um, you know, high quality investor as well. Um, the quality shareholders, I'm like somewhat mixed on because, on the one hand, you know, shareholders never really had to be tested with dealing with a bad time in the like investment that in the investment side for Buffett himself. There are periods where the stock underperformed. And I think that was really valuable having shareholders who didn't necessarily like throw in the towel and like push Buffett to get more involved in tech when others wouldn't. Right. But like you said, not that they would have been able to anyway. So you know, it's probably less consequential than meets the eye. Um, yeah, but not yeah, only, not only would they not, not only would they not have the ability to, but he would just never yield to it, right? I mean, mm -hmm. which is why I, I keep coming back to the most important thing about this whole company is the people running it. You know, it's right? just yeah, a all this other a stuff, lifetime genius. Exactly. So all this other stuff is great. All this other stuff is necessary, but I don't know how you get something like this put together without putting the man himself right at the very top because it's his creation. It's literally his paint. So, you know, yes, you needed all these other ingredients, but you know, they were all just kind of reinforcing, they were creating their own redundancies in, in what he already had going. Exactly. Exactly. And so like, if you don't want to say the one person, it's just that, like you said, they adapted, they evolved. It's not the same Berkshire, not the same strategy that existed from day one. And I don't mean day one, like it, not that it's not a textile factory, but like, you know, the ethos behind how they invest has evolved. And I think that's been one of the most impressive things because a lot of investors uh, can't perform in, when the environment changes beneath them. And so that's, you know, truly an accomplishment. John, I'm curious what you think. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you guys that you know, Buffett and Munger are the keys here. And, uh, you know, that's what makes Berkshire what it is. And, and it cannot be replicated. You know, certainly having a trust-based culture is important a lot. You know, all of these uh, things like decentralized managers, long time horizon quality shareholders are clearly important, but that's not really the heart of Berkshire, which, you know, it's pretty much just Warren Buffett and yeah, Munger as well. But uh, I, I feel like, you know, what does that say about the future of Berkshire? And to me, you know, I, I do have some worries or expectations that basically Berkshire is not going to persist uh, as a as a company the way we know it today. Once once Buffett uh, is gone, because ultimately, you know, you got to consider the incentives. Uh, a lot of the stock will be held by 
the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And um, the incentives basically are to to maximize the shareholder value ultimately. And I think they're going to find that um, the you know the conglomerate structure isn't probably the way to do that post Buffett. Um, so I feel like you know if Berkshire sh- should have persisted that over time, you know Buffett really needed to make it into more than than uh, his creation. You know either by kind of really concentrating in one business, where basically then it's no longer a holding company but really a an operating business with maybe some some non-core assets, but really focused uh, very much on on one business Um, or some kind of a greater mission that can serve as a unifying force um, for the company in the future. Because I I feel like, you know, the mission has basically been to to do right by the shareholders and to to create uh, tons of shareholder value. Um, you know, so th- that's my take kind of, um, you know, goes back to, to Buffett. And, and I think that's what makes Berkshire really, uh, his company. So John, am I, am I mischaracterizing your, your point? Or are you saying that you think within some reasonable number of years after Buffett's no longer in charge, that the company won't, won't have its current, you know, kind of characteristics and, and an overall path? I just don't see how you you replicate Buffett, you know. Oh, oh, I agree with that. Yeah, for sure. I thought you were saying something a little stronger than that. Yeah, probably I was, you know, even though the culture is there, um the culture of doing right by the shareholders, but I feel like they're going to start realizing that you do right by the shareholders by not keeping everything together. Um, you know, so I I I think there might be a slimmed down version of Berkshire as um, they're able to monetize some of the assets and, you know, we'll have to see where the stock is and all of that. Maybe uh, they can do some, um, you know, some kind of financial engineering with uh, shedding some assets, buying back shares, who knows. But I I don't think they're going to stick with um, just making it bigger and bigger and bigger over time, because ultimately that is what would happen if you hold on to all your assets and your compounding capital, it would just become even bigger. And I just don't see that happening without uh, Buffett at the helm. Yeah, sure. I, look, I totally agree that, you know, the and he's he's been laying the groundwork for this for a couple of decades, at least, that, you know, the size would be an anchor. And at, at some point, I mean, they're continuously putting themselves up against the retained earning test, right? And the dividend test that they have to be able to create more than a dollar of value for every dollar that they of capital that they retain. And so, you know, he has faced some pushback on that. And, and, and he's, again, to what we were talking about earlier, though, been willing to adapt, right? We're no longer on just a pure book value test. The level of share repurchases has been adjusted, right? This is not a static enterprise or a static test. So I, I agree. I mean, at some point, the company will become too large. At some point after the guiding light has gone out, things will have to change. But I think it's got as good a chance as any company organization I've seen, at least in commercial enterprise, that I've seen that that will continue to have this. The, the attributes we just did talk about, like we said, that are all important, still persisting. Let's say I, I'd put the over under it at least a decade and a half, right? I mean, I just don't see any scenario in which the culture and the structure that has been built is going to change materially in the first five to 10 years. Would you guys take the take the other side of that? I'm going to give an on the one hand, on the other hand. So on the one hand, you have a situation where we all agree that the uniqueness of Berkshire is Buffett himself, right? The greatest strength. And so once he's not around they lose their greatest strength. But this is where, you know, thinking about the other possibilities on the list of uh, four options, like it's not trust-based culture. It's specifically decentralized autonomous managers. And each of the managers has had, you know, incredible latitude in operating their own business accordingly. And that very like nature I think creates for a pretty seamless transition. Um, You don't exactly need 
uh, much oversight on any of these businesses to operate and to keep going with the same principles, the same business practices that existed before. And I guess that means the greatest question becomes, you know, uh, while while operations have been decentralized, capital allocation has been centralized. So to what extent there's some continuity in in that between like Wexler and Combs is hard to say. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's hard, it, it's really hard to say, but like the autonomy that each of the business units has gives them a great deal of time to kind of figure out exactly what to do. And in the meantime, I mean, one option would be just uh, starting with the dividend or just continuing, I mean, repurchases. If, if I would point out one notable thing of the last quarter, it's that repurchases are actually happening at a pretty meaningful pace. Um, so maybe that just keeps keeps on up. Uh, what do you think? I mean, I'll, I'll, I, I guess I would take the under fill on your question. Really? Okay. Um, All right, that's well, interesting. I mean, just because if this was any other company, I think you'd have shareholders saying, you know, why do we have an insurance business attached to a railroad attached to an energy business? Why don't we just, um, you know, distribute those assets to the shareholders as you know, three or four or five companies or what have you? makes it easier to incentivize the people at the helm of those companies. And I just feel like when Buffett's no longer there, you know, that is going to become the argument at some point that you can just incentivize people better if they're running, uh, if they're at the helm of a company and they're going to be good operators plus good capital allocators. Um, So, you know, you're going to have both of those things uh, still taken care of. But I just have a hard time seeing post Buffett that you know the CEOs of those operating companies are going to look to Omaha as favorably as they have when you know they're they're actually talking and and sending their cash up to Buffett. But you think then? I, I agree that there will be some pressure, right? I mean, there, there's already been at least every year that I've ever attended or even listened to the old archives of the annual meetings. There's always been some idiot you know, basically telling Buffett he's wrong and that he should be paying a dividend or, you know, spinning off a division or monetizing, selling assets, whatever. So I, I agree that that pressure will get louder and it will be uh, a, a much different response. It'll be much harder for the management team in place and the board in place to respond because they, of course, will not be Buffett. But do you think that the board will actually, in the management the CEO and the, the management in place will actually act on that in the first five or 10 years? Like they'll actually spin off Burlington Northern or the energy assets or, you know, something like that, Big break up the company more or less? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I I, I don't know that it matters uh, what I think because I, I, I have no clue. I just feel like, you know, the, the argument is going to be pretty strong that you have a, a number of really strong people. There's no longer one genius, you know, one godlike figure at the top. Um, you have a number of really strong people. And why not have, you know, several lean entities that are more focused, that eliminate kind of the conglomerate discount and who knows what? That's going to be pretty strong. Um, And, you know, the culture can kind of carry through to those to those successor companies. So, you know, I don't know it. it, You know, we're just we're just guessing. But I feel like it wouldn't even be the worst thing in the world. I mean, why would that be a bad thing if you have several companies that are operated really well, that are doing right by the shareholders and uh, they're just a bit leaner and, and, you know, can act a bit more uh, independently. Yeah, I'm curious. I, I agree. It, it, it's not the end of the world. Go ahead, Elliot. Do you guys see it as at all problematic that Buffett has not been more forward in contemplating uh, succession and the next decade? No, I think he's been extremely forward in it. And it, it's just not apparent from the outside. So I think this stuff has consumed more thoughtful attention from him than it has at just about any other organization in the history of the world. And to the extent that anyone can get it right, I think he's been prepared to get it right at every step along the way. So I don't, I think by not announcing it publicly, I think there are some very good reasons for that, right? I mean, I think if you had come out and at any point named a successor, 
what does that do, right? I mean, it doesn't achieve anything. It just gives that person more pressure. It, it sort of paints a bullseye on them unnecessarily when, when that job is already going to be hard enough when that day finally comes. So I, I have absolutely no hesitation in, in saying that, you know, this has been extremely well thought out and well planned the whole way along. And it just, you know, it, it's, it's sort of like, why don't you name more uh, compensation, you know, results for, for internal managers, because it creates, you know, weird knock-on effects. Right. And, and so his, one of his most important jobs is figuring out who to hire and how to pay, how to pay them and how to motivate them over time. And, and, and he doesn't disclose that publicly, but I think the results speak for themselves. And I think just in a similar way, you know, a, another crucial job that he has is planning for the, you know, succession uh, to the next generation. And I think it's been handled every bit as well. And so I don't, I don't have any problem there at all. Yeah. I wonder about that. John, what do you think? Uh, yeah. I, I'm not sure because we don't really know what's going on inside of Berkshire. I do believe that Phil is right that, you know, if Buffett were to pass away at any moment, Berkshire would know exactly what to do. There wouldn't be any doubt. So I, I, I do think that's, that's very much in place. But again, you know, nobody can replace Buffett. You know, there's going to be uh, people handling different things, but, but you know, Buffett's just not going to be there anymore. I mean, what I, what I would say, and this is a super stretched analogy, but um, so bear with me. <laughs> I'm going to get some, some eyeballs rolling here for sure. But, you know, my, my kids have been watching Hamilton a lot over the past year after Disney, I think it was Disney Plus made it available, right? So I've seen it in person, but they've been watching it a lot. And I've read the book twice, so it's, it just comes to front of mind. But the same sort of thing happened when George Washington kind of voluntarily stepped aside, right? He's like, if I don't plan this well and I don't step aside, you know, the country will never never grow and move on. And so Berkshire is not America. America is not Berkshire. Obviously, this is a stretch, tortured analogy, but I do, and, and America's had plenty of problems over those ensuing centuries, right? But I do think there's something to be said for getting the structure and the culture right so that it can outlast one person, even though in this case, one person was almost singularly responsible for building Berkshire and, and not the country, obviously. But, you know, I think that there's something to be said that there was kind of one person uniquely capable of leading the country in those early days, and that was Washington. And, and you know, he passed the torch and it wasn't perfect and it wasn't pretty, but it worked. And, you know, it was, there was some brilliant design that went into that process. And I think the same thing holds true here. So I understand people being hesitant. I understand people being concerned. I just, I, I'm not, I, I'm in the way more, sanguine glass half full camp on this on this topic when it comes to that. Yeah, no, and I definitely appreciate the way you're putting it. It's obviously something that he's contemplated. I just feel, I don't know, maybe it's like how candid and transparent Buffett's been about critical questions, including, you know, at a couple points in time being like, our performance won't keep up with what it had been in the past. I think that's a pretty, you know, um, it, it's a tough pill to swallow for shareholders at certain times, but you know he's been willing to say the hard stuff, um, and I understand how putting certain things forward could handicap their ability to act. So, where his grand plan to be like, let's you know break things apart and realize value of each piece, you know, it makes operating today that much more challenging. So you have to keep that tight to the vest. Where that does. Attach- but- you know, another thing here to consider is that part of the magic and the genius has been that he's been able to allocate capital freely across all of these entities in a very tax friendly manner. And it's not really even feasible early on to unwind it, right? Like, I think one of the insurance portfolios owns big chunks of the operating subsidiaries, they all own pieces of each other. Um, I forget which entity even owns BNSF off the top of my head. So you you couldn't actually practically unwind these things without a massive amount of tax leakage that I don't think anybody would really want. And and then of course if you do that, you forestall the option that that whoever comes in his in his stead is going to be at least halfway decent at allocating that capital. And so again, I mean, it, of course, there's no replicating his success, but that's also kind of preordained by the size of the organization. So if somebody comes next and continues to have the same tools at his or her disposal and can just 
you know, instead of swinging for the fences every once in a while, just continue to pile up walks and singles. I mean, that that's probably going to be a better result than breaking it up or waving the white flag, in my opinion. Okay, well, we'll find out, I guess, uh, what will happen down the road. I, 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 I think we all agree that Berkshire will continue to generate shareholder value in whatever form that is um, for a long time to come. Let's move on, uh, Elliot, to your topic of the week. Sure, yeah. I wanted to, in some ways, I hope, continue on from last week where I spoke about emerging quality and speak to the topic of uncertainty in investing. Um, I think uncertainty is something that's interesting and important. It's something a lot of people, you know, I think confuse in some ways um, we all as investors like to think probabilistically and, you know, that's critically important and in a ways that embraces uncertainty, but some things get lost along the way. So I had a tweet teasing the topic, uh, when I settled on it for sure is what I'd like to discuss this week. Um, tweeted out a link to mentions of the word uncertainty in company transcripts going back to 2004. And there was this like, uh, mini peak in the financial crisis, but the true financial crisis peak happened in 2012, which was a time I felt, you know, personally that some of the uncertainty actually had been lifting despite, you know, immense uncertainty about what happens with the Eurozone and what's happening in the world. Um, and, you know, obviously more recently, there was an even more pronounced peak uh, around COVID, which, uh, you know, I think is truly the definition of uncertainty in a lot of ways. So let's define uncertainty. The first time I was exposed to this distinction between risk and uncertainty, it was by Michael Mobson. And the way it was defined is that risk is we don't know what is going to happen next, but we do know what the distribution looks like. And uncertainty is we don't know what is going to happen next, and we do not know what the possible distribution looks like. Um, and, you know, I think that raises a, a really important distinction distinction. Um, in risk, you could have a very clear sense of the extent to which something can be wrong. But in uncertainty, really, you know, you don't know anything. And so, you know, when you're investing in growth, I think that's one of the biggest reasons a lot of uh, value investors find frustrations with uncertainty. There's a preference to focus on what you know, underwrite to what you know, ignore and even avoid situations where there are things that are inherently unknowable. Uh, but certain times, you know, uncertainty in and of itself can be priced wrong. Um, there was a great essay by Justin Fox during the, the peak of mentions of uncertainty in 2012. He's like, he the, the title was Embrace Uncertainty Rather Than Whine About It. And he literally told uh, these business leaders who are complaining about uncertainty that they should, you know, look for opportunities to invest into it rather than, you know, just talk about how uncertain things are. Uh, and, you know, in certain contexts, I think today, um, when I hear certain uh, backlash and critiques about companies that are interesting, that have growth opportunities, a lot of it centers around the uncertainty. So Canby is a company I've been involved with. And so, you know, there are two big questions over Canby. What happens when DraftKings uh, is no longer a customer? And what does the end state of the sports business look like? And, you know, the DraftKings question is a risk. It's one you could actually quantify. You know the contribution of DraftKings to the business. You could underwrite to exactly what the business looks like with or without DraftKings. The end state of the industry, on the other hand, is something that's inherently uncertain. No one, no one, not not a single operator at any one of the leaders, uh, at any one of the industry leaders, uh, or anyone looking to invest in the sector knows exactly what it's going to look like. There are certain templates we could use. There are certain ways you could handicap it, but you just don't know uh, what it actually looks like. So when you think about it from an investing perspective, what I'd say is I look for scenarios where the skew of uncertainty is to things that could, by and large, lead to better outcomes for the company than what you're contemplating at the time of underwriting. So you want to have a business, you want to look for businesses where, you know, there's a lot that you can know about it. There are things that you could grasp. There are distinct risks that you could actually quantify. And there are uncertainties in the 
primary sources of the uncertainty are not, you know, about what can go wrong, but about what can go right. And, you know, that's one of the beauties of uncertainty. You could paint a pretty broad spectrum of where things go. Um, so, you know, that's my general introduction to the topic of uncertainty. I'm curious how you guys think about uncertain investing situations and how to apply discipline while investing into that. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. So you said that was a, what paper was that from, from Mobis and where did he cite that definition of risk and uncertainty? I don't think I've ever actually seen that before from him. I don't remember which one it was, but I wrote it down for myself and have like okay. looked at it many times since. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, the way I've seen it framed by other people before uh, is a little bit different. I mean, I've always thought about it as uh, almost not the inverse of that, but kind of a, a twist on it. Like risk is it, the way I think about risk is, of course, you know, permanent loss and damage that you can't reverse and all that sort of stuff. But it, it, in a broader sense, it would mean, you know, more things can happen than will happen which I think is attributed to Elroy Dimson at London Business School, which is, in my opinion, the most, you know, practical and most intelligent definition of risk. And I love that one. And the way I always see uncertainty get framed, I mean, it's interesting you did a search on it. This would be a cool, you know, longer form research project. But yeah, it seems to me that the way uncertainty is usually kind of used or framed in the colloquial sense is like a cop-out, right? Like, I don't know when something's going to happen, um, or, you know, I, I'm concerned about something that's transient and passing. And so I'm not, I, I'm just going to kind of sit by while I wait for the storm to clear, but there's not really a, a, an expectation that the storm will persist forever. So that the concept of uncertainty being related to not knowing the distribution at all, isn't really how I've thought about it in the past, but there's an interesting it's an interesting way of doing it. And so, but I, I totally agree with what I think your conclusion was, which is that you should go looking for areas where you can frame kind of the harmful side effects, the harmful left tail, so to speak, and go after, you know, the positive stuff that you just don't know about. Right? So you don't know what good things are going to happen. You don't know what's around the corner. Uh, you certainly can't predict the timing of it very well. There's lots of uncertainty in the details, but you know, in the big picture that, you're not going to lose very much or if anything, and that some really good things could come forward from it. So I, I love that idea. I mean, I think it's one of the more powerful ideas in investing and uh, it's it's hard to employ in practice because usually when there's uncertainty, there's emotions and psychology working against you, right? A lot of people and a lot of feelings are telling you not to act when chances are the odds are never going to be more favorable than that moment, right? Exactly right. And I to that end, I, I personally don't like that more things can happen than will happen as a definition of risk, because there are certain situations where that's actually naturally the opposite of risk. And that is your opportunity. <laughs> you know, I, I could. What do you what do you mean? I don't, I don't think I don't think I followed that one more time. More things can happen than will happen. Um, what if all those right. more things are actually, you know, things are better than you'd actually oh. No, no, I, I agree. So, yeah. I, I, yeah. So I think we're saying the right thing then. So we're, we're talking again about the the distribution of those more things being favorable to you, but I agree. Right. So I yeah. Think and what you said makes me think of, you know, I actually incidentally in a separate note tweeted out uh, yesterday, the um, maybe two days ago, like Nick sleeps point about how like businesses are traveling down branches and each branch that they move down has uh, its own probability of what happens next. And when you go down a good branch, it inherently increases the likelihood that the next branch is, you know, both either good or or even better than the prior. And it's like, that's the kind of uncertainty you want to get where, you know, there are many branches. And when the first good outcome happens, each of the following branches get better than the one before that. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, that's an interesting way of putting it. And there was something I saw recently from Wait But Why, which is an interesting uh, blog, among other things. And they had the same same sort of kind of decision tree style map where it was like, you know, things that could have happened or paths you could have taken in your life, but obviously you could only actually take one of them. So you look back at all these closed doors, so to speak, but then you're forgetting about the fact that from this point forward, literally this instant through the rest of your life, you have all these other paths that are still open to you. And that's what you should actually be worried about. Not the things that didn't work out or the paths you didn't take 
in the past. And so I think that's a, a good way of framing it. Yeah. And that's what I actually tweeted it out in response to seeing that weight oh, okay. by uh, tree. And, yeah. you know, to take it one step back to the the growth companies, it's like the really good emerging uh, emerging quality companies um, have built many different branches down which they can travel. Uh, and each of the branches is something good and an opportunity. And you just don't know which one's the best one per se. Maybe the company has, or but realistically, the company should have much better visibility into which ones are the best ones and should allocate their resources accordingly. Um, but you want to have a lot of different adjacent possibilities to explore. And I think that increases your likelihood of success uh, because one branch might be cut off, but you could go down a different one that creates its own set of favorable uh, possibilities from there. Um, and I think it's a lot about thinking in those terms about, you know, understanding the trajectories and paths and what doors each one's open or not. Yeah, it's, and, and one other thing that I would add too about what you started with on the the difference between risk and uncertainty is knowing the distribution or not knowing the distribution. And I think that's where I get hung up on it is that I think a lot of people get that just dead wrong, right? So I, another thing that I'd recommend a, a podcast called Risk of Ruin uh, that I started listening to about a week ago has some really fantastic episodes on it. And one of them involves LTCM and they got Eric Rosenfeld to come on and talk about it. And uh, there were some really interesting little tidbits and nuggets in there. But I just kept thinking about how, you know, he, he did come around to the end and saying like, yeah, you just can't do this kind of stuff and take on a lot of leverage. And it's like, yeah, that, that is the <laughs> lesson. But I think, I think the point though, is that like, they thought they had nailed the risks that they were taking, right? They thought they knew the distribution of what they were doing and they did, right? They, and they would admit it, right? I mean, there's no other conclusion to draw other than that they just completely whiffed on getting the distribution right. And so uh, that is that is super risky when, you know, when you think you know the distribution and you don't, I can't think of anything that is riskier, right? So I don't know whether you want to call that risk or uncertainty, but that's really the crux of everything we're trying to do, right? Is not confuse the times where you know the distributions with times you don't know the distribution. And that gets to, you know, Keynes could have told long-term capital why they were going wrong a uh, hundred years ago, right? Market could stay irrational more than you could stay solvent. And sure. there's a path dependency problem there too, because in the end Absolutely. you could end up right. But if things don't move exactly as you'd want in the interim, um, that doesn't, you know, it, it's definitely relevant because once companies go down a certain path, it's potentially really challenging to walk backwards and go down a new one. But at least the same kind of path dependency and inertia that exists once you are already uh, moving in a certain way is 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 not as... Uh, deterministic to end states for you there. Right. Which is where this could be an interesting example, right? Because there is that path dependency. And again, this gets into, I guess, more semantics than anything else, if it's risk or uncertainty, but they got the distribution almost exactly right. So I think one of the interesting nuggets on this was that Rosenfeld did the math and that in the first 10 to 12 months, had Buffett's offer been accepted, right? So and remember, the only reason Buffett's deal didn't get done was because there was basically a communication failure, right? Like the satellite phones and all that stuff when he was on that trip with Bill Gates. But so if he'd put in three or four billion on the terms he had proposed, Rosenfeld kind of tracked the trades that in the portfolio as they would have existed over the following year. And he said Buffett would have doubled his money in the first under the first 12 months, which is pretty astonishing, right? But again, it, it points out the fact that you still got it dead wrong because for that first, it doesn't matter over 12 months, if over the first 12 weeks or even the first 12 days, you're completely out of business if you're the one that put the trades <laughs> on in the first place, right? So it, I don't know whether, but it, I, I guess you could call that uncertainty because you, you kind of knew the trades would work, but you just didn't know when. And that's the problem when you finance them all with short-term liabilities or you over leverage them in a way that you can get carried out, it doesn't really matter. I wonder, so I know it's tangential from where we started, but with that example, so um, how does Rosengren know in hindsight, like the counterfactual that it would have played out that way? Well, he does, he's, he doesn't, but what he's, what he was trying to do or what I, what he did do, I think was he just took the portfolio as it existed and tracked it over, you know, once the crisis had passed, right? So regardless of who stabilized the situation, right? Whether it was Buffett or the Fed and the consortium that ultimately came in, or if long-term capital had just had its own resources to 
stabilize its own portfolio, right? I mean, these were, for the most part, treasuries and fixed income obligations that continued to trade and 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 exist after this. So once things normalized and spreads kind of calmed back down and came back into their their normal realm, it would have been enormously profitable. I think that was what he was trying to do. Got it. And to that end, I mean, it's a really interesting example because they were people who thought they could grasp every risk that they that they were taking. Exactly. Exactly. And it was uncertainty that bit them in the end, in some ways, a uh, risk they hadn't contemplated, part of the distribution that just wasn't in the realm of, of their uh, computational. That's exactly it. Yeah. I guess I'll jump in. Um, you know, I think there's obviously a lot of semantics in, in how you think about risk and uncertainty, and, and I'm not sure it's that helpful to to get into the semantics. I uh, I get more value out of thinking about implications for investing. You know, um, if you take the Pabrai definition of risk and uncertainty, I think what he was really talking about was um, kind of fill what you alluded to with risk, uh, permanent loss of capital, and then uncertainty is just not knowing how the future will play out. But as Elliot, you mentioned, um, you know, uncertainty can be a good thing, especially if, if pretty much all the options on the table are kind of options to the upside. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, I, I kind of think of it as known probabilities or unknown probabilities. You know, rolling a die, you know the probabilities of, of rolling a one or a six or what have you. But uh, in investing, most of the probabilities are unknown. Um, so, you know, we're trying to estimate those uh, based on our own analysis, based on the data and, and so forth to decide whether um, a company is a good investment. Um, in terms of just kind of setups that that I found helpful is when you feel like a situation has a lot of downside protection, you're not paying too much for um, what a company offers today, and then you have uncertainty to the upside, um, you know, that's that's worked out pretty well. Um, so that's kind of how I think about it. You know, Elliot's talking about emerging quality, uh, not to uh, overplay uh, Twitter, but if you take Twitter as an example, I feel like you know that company um obviously quality in terms of the 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 user experience uh, has been very high quality for a long time but in terms of financial characteristics uh not yet but you could say it's emerging quality and there's a lot of uncertainty to the upside in terms of what what are going to be the drivers of um free cash flow you know 10 years from now or what's going to drive most of the value we don't know but i feel like uh, you know, if you take um, the valuation of Twitter compared to a Facebook or some other um, companies out there, it's it's quite low on a per user basis. And uh, with Twitter uh, paying more attention to monetization and clearly having avenues to monetize, um, you know, you can kind of bet on that uncertainty. I feel like um, even though you may not know exactly how it's going to play out. Yeah, that's a really good example. You look at something like, you, you know, you contrast Twitter with Snapchat and Pinterest, and it's like the market's allure for the white space is a lot greater than um, the allure for the known entity who still has similar white space just because it is, you know, a little more known, a little more time, um, and some of these problems. And the uncertainty, like you're saying, like you're suggesting, is skewed in a very different direction. Um when the bar is very high, you have to deliver, you have to get things right. Um, and when the bar is low, you just, you know, you don't. And if any one thing goes right, you, you become that uh, more shiny object. So to put it a little differently, John, I think we'd probably agree, we're both agree with this statement, right? Which is that there's uncertainty as to what is going to happen with Berkshire after Buffett is no longer on the scene, right? We don't, so we certainly don't really know what exactly is going to happen and what the future company, future course of the company is going to look like. But we, I think I certainly would say that there isn't a ton of risk or even any material risk that the company is just going to fall apart, that it's going to prove to be a whole worth a whole lot less than where it's trading today, that it's going to be just kind of an unmitigated disaster either as a company or as an investment, right? 
Oh, yeah, totally agree. I mean, you know, I don't see any risk with Berkshire um, kind of not creating shareholder value um, for a long time. I think if they do break apart, it'll be to because they believe it'll create even more value, you know, not not because uh, something right. went wrong. So, yeah, I, we're totally on the same page there, I think. Um, so you that's, know, that's, I think, like the best working definition of risk and uncertainty that I've found right, is to kind of put it in those terms. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's, you know, we can agree there's a lot of uncertainty as to what, you know, what the what will happen to Berkshire post Buffett, but I don't think any of us feel like uh, there's going to be risk of uh, loss of capital. Right. All right. And that's the most important thing for me anyway. Yeah, I'm with you there. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I mean, to the extent that there is risk, it's probably, you know, Buffett's prowess minus the prowess of, you know, the one or two people that take over for him. So it's like, you know, it's not risk to the stock per se, but it's risk in uh, execution. Yeah, and I think we we talked about this a few weeks ago with the discussion about best investments of all time. And, and for me, the best personally that I've ever seen were exactly this type of scenario, right? It was in the teeth of the financing, financial crisis and the housing crisis with companies that were literally in chapter 11, right? They're in bankruptcy court as I was making the investments, but so there was tons of uncertainty, right? You didn't know who was going to control the company when it emerged. You didn't know when it was going to emerge. You didn't know how long it was going to take to emerge. You didn't know what the economy was going to look like on the back end of this, but there really wasn't very much risk because in in, in, in these specific cases, you were buying below the value of the net realizable cash on the balance sheet, right? You were basically getting the reorganized business for free. So to Elliot's point, like, you know, there were lots of things that could happen, but they were all to your benefit. And that to me is just total nirvana. And that's why distressed investing and, and uh, in a broader sense, value investing works so well is when you have that giant margin of safety and you you take away the risks, you just ride out the uncertainty and, and let it come as it may. And, and those are really favorable odds. By the way, everything you said applies pretty equally to COVID. And I think it shows, especially with the recency of it, it's like very hard in the heat of the moment to distinguish between, you know, risk and uncertainty. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. Um, it's it's a little different when you look like one company at a time while things are like in a state of equilibrium and try to piece apart, you know, what are the risks to this company? How do I quantify them? And what things are uncertain? And, you know, how do I think about what range it could possibly play out on? And what are the, like, unknown unknowns that might bite me that I'm not thinking of, but like all these things are a little separate and apart from risk. And I don't think it's merely semantics. Like there is something to uh, being able to have some sort of like framework for uh, deciphering which falls in in where. Um, but man, you know, just thinking, reflecting on some of my own thought processes at the time in, in, in the heat of COVID, like you know, there were some situations I got very right and thinking like, okay, you know, there's there's not risk here. It's just uncertainty. Uh, and it's only a matter of like, is it 2022 or 2024 uh, when I could think of totally normal? Uh, but there are other situations where it's like, okay, this is a pretty levered business. Some things are not going to go right. Like I could, I could be distinct with what the risks are. Uh, but really, you know, they were more uncertainties than risks. Yeah, that's a great, I was actually going to bring this up if, if, we had time during my section on Berkshire. And I think that was something that I found really fascinating was uh, to your point about, you know, Rosenfeld proved, trying to prove the counterfactual, of what happened if LTCM could have hung on, you know, it, there are certain circles that try to pr- try to criticize Buffett for having not pulled the trigger more during March and April of 2020 as the pandemic was setting in and markets were, were paralyzed. And, and, it, you know, so what you mentioned is great, Elliot. I mean, if you can find, investments like the ones you just described where it's like, you know, look, I think I've got the distribution hugely in my favor. I don't know if this works out in 2022 or 2024 or whatever, but I'm perfectly happy and willing and able to sit this through and and, and see it see it to its end on that level. That's awesome, right? I mean, that is exactly what you're always looking for. And so then people pile on the buff and say, why'd you hold so much cash? Why didn't you repurchase shares? Or why did you sell the airlines in April of 2020? And I think that just gets it completely dead wrong. I mean, basically what you're saying is that Buffett had the probabilities and the distribution wrong at the time, or you're saying that he was, you know, falling victim to fear and it outweighed, you know, a rational, calm response to what was going on. And, and there, I think the key distinction is that 
again, like there, there was a distribution, there was a probability there that things could have gone much, much worse, both for individual businesses, for the economy writ large, for Berkshire specifically. I mean, there were some, some scenarios there and we'd have to talk specifics and then we'd have to talk in some really, you know, absurdly wide ranges about what was possible. But I just categorically disagree that it was a foregone conclusion that, you know, all these things that now looked so obvious with hindsight were, were really, you know, priced as such or really could be underwritten as such in, in March and April of last year. So true. It's one of those critiques. It drives me absolutely nuts. We didn't even know how contagious or deadly COVID was. No one had a clue about anything. It was immensely uncertain. Right. Um, and so if you didn't even know the basics about what you were dealing with on the virus's terms, like how could you even handicap anything? Um, and handicapping is, you know, how, how do you underwrite to the known risks, right? Like, how do you even handicap anything that could possibly happen uh, from our response to like when we get back to normal and all that without knowing some of these basic things? Yeah. And so that that's the real trick is right. When you don't know things, you're swimming around in all this uncertainty and some real risk and you're facing it. And then you have to, when you're able to continuously update things, you can't get stuck down in your prior conclusions, right? I mean, to your point about the virus, I mean, I remember exactly a year ago right now, we're, we're still wiping down our groceries. You know, you're, you're terrified of all these things that just proved to be the, the wrong thing to worry about, right? So you have to say, okay, well, that was wrong. Now I have to focus on what matters, right? And so pretty quickly there in March and April, you had a matter of a few weeks to kind of pivot from oh my God, you know, unemployment's going to go through the roof. You know, the markets are going to crash even further. You know, the economy is going to be in the ditch for years to like, well, wait a minute, that's actually not how things are playing out. That's, you know, this policy, that response, this stimulus, this psychological change, all this stuff is changing day by day and you have to react to it, right? And it's hard. But I mean, the fact that you can sit there and say after the fact, like, oh, Bob, it was wrong for doing what he did at the time, just ignores reality and ignores what else could have happened. So it's so easy in hindsight, right? <laughs> it's very easy in hindsight. That's right. That, you know, it's like golf, if you play golf and you play the second ball, it's like the second golfer is always a scratch. He's just so awesome, right? It's very <laughs> easy to look back and get it right on the second try. Well, you guys also mentioned margin of safety. And I think that's also a, a key concept to bring in here because I feel like if you have a, a large margin of safety, you're kind of uh, eliminating risk to a large degree. And there may still be a ton of uncertainty, but you don't really have a ton of risk. And the flip side of that coin, of course, is that if you don't have a margin of safety, if you're, if you're investing in something that has a very high nosebleed valuation right now, um, you're taking on a lot of risk. Um, now, things may work out, uh, but... If, if the company doesn't execute exactly how investors expect, you could actually see permanent impairment of capital. And I feel like that's where a lot of investors are just not aware of, of the risk they're taking on uh, by paying the prices they're paying for certain securities. Yeah, and that's exactly where the uncertainty is like skewed against you, where it works, you know. And, and by the way, there's also a path dependency there because like, over the course of five years, they might deliver on the aspirations, but if in year 1.5, they're starting to fall short, um, whether it be because of macro or like, you know, intrinsic uh, hiccups, which do happen on the path to greatness, um, you're going to have to face some very tough questions along the way, no matter what. And so when you could get a situation where you're buying something and, you know, another way to put this is you want optionality, right? You want embedded optionality in a position you're taking. You want to have something like known and fair and your margin of safety that you could anchor against um, where, you know, the good stuff gives you an opportunity for something even better. Um, that's that's how I try to think about it. Yeah, that's well said. I, I don't think I can improve on that definition. Agreed on that. Well, thank you, guys. This has been a great discussion. I really enjoyed it, and I hope everyone listening did as well. Take care for now. Thank you for listening to This Week in Intelligent Investing, brought to you exclusively by MOI Global, the research-driven membership organization. Learn more at moiglobal.com.